Hello and welcome to this presentation. My name is Roland and I'm happy to be your host for this session. This session is about how to interact with your canisters using JavaScript. Don't worry, this is a beginner's introduction into identity, agents and actors. After this lecture, you will have a solid foundation to get started with your own example. Before we start, let me introduce myself. My name is Roland Bohle and I'm based in Austria. I run a small software company called Some Linux Development with some employees. We develop web-based business applications and software as a service solutions for clients in Austria. Since May 2021, I'm interested in the internet computer and I have finished Motoko Bootcamp last year. Currently, we are working on variable, a qualification and certification platform written in web new technologies, but with some IC components. Now that you know something more about me, we can start with this lecture. Let's start with a short overview of this session. This lecture is divided into two parts. The first part provides some background information about the main building blocks for the interaction between front-end and back-end canisters. These building blocks are identity agents and actors. Further, I will show you some ways to build and deploy your projects on the IC as well. The second part shows an hands-on example. I will present a simple crude application and show you how easy it is to connect a front-end descent canister with a Motoko backend canister. Let's jump into the building blocks. The first building block we are talking about is identity. Identity management is crucial on the internet computer and maybe you are a little bit familiar with that term. Because you have already used the default developer identity for your involvement project as well. The developer identity is also known as a principal identifier and is used for several actions on the internet computer. Some actions are deployment, requests between front-end and back-end canisters or even cycle management. To keep these terms separated, I have formulated some questions for each term to make the meaning of the term clear. For identity, we can formulate who is asking and the answer is the developer identity is asking. The second building block are agents. Agents are libraries used to call the public internet computer interface. And in fact, agents does the heavy lifting for us. Currently, agents are supported for two languages, JavaScript and Rust. Please note, you can use JavaScript also on the Node.js site. There are some community supported agents as well. These would be .NET, Dart, Go, Java, Python, and I'm positive to see some more on that list in the future. The question for that building block we can formulate is, how does the frontend call the backend? And the answer is, we can use a ready to use JavaScript agent to call the Motoko backend canister. The last building block we are going to talk is finally called actor. The term actor belongs to the actor model from the Motoko language. You can understand an actor as an isolated object which runs asynchronous tasks on a Motoko canister. The question we can formulate is, what do we call on the backend? And the answer is, the agent can call public exposed functions on the Motoko canister. And this is the connection between the front-end and the back-end canister. That means that the agent calls a public exposed function from the actor and in this way the data flows between the front-end and the back-end canister. In order to make the connection between the building blocks and the typical HTTP request clear, I have assigned the individual building blocks to the respective phase in order to demonstrate how the data flows. When a user sends a request to the front-end canister, we have two possibilities. First, the front-end canister can only serve static assets. For example, if you want to serve a static HTML site generated from a static site generator such as Hugo, in this case, we don't need neither an agent nor an identity. The front-end canister behaves like a lightweight web server and delivers the HTML page back to the user's browser. 
In the second scenario, the front-end canister can also request some data from a back-end Modoko canister. In this case, we can speak of dynamic content. For example, in a traditional web application, you would request at this point some data from a REST API. But in our case, we want query or update some data from a Modoko backend canister. And this is where the identity and agent building blocks came into play. The JavaScript agent calls the public exposed function from the actor and receives some data which can be used in the front-end application and later delivered back to the user's browser. Let's jump into the first building block in detail. As I have mentioned before, identity management is a crucial thing on the internet computer and you should have an eye on it, also if you are a beginner. When you use the dfx command for the first time, the so-called default developer identity is generated automatically for you. You can easily check which identity you are currently using with a simple command in the terminal. The command is dfx identity who am I? And you should see the name of the currently used identity. Maybe it is the default identity. I would like to mention that you are not limited to the default identity. You can use as many identities as you want. For that, feel free to check out the corresponding part in the documentation or additional lectures on the bootcamp as well. It is also important to note that all identities are not located in your prior projects folder. There is a separate place on the file system for that. It is under your home directory in a hidden folder named .config dfx identity. You can check this folder out and display all identities which you have created with a simple command ls subcommand l. If you use this command for this path, you will see three files. The first file is the identity pen file. This is the most important file because this file represents your private key and you should take care on that file or on the recovery phrase. The second file is identity JSON. This file contains some encryption information for your private key. And the last file is wallets JSON. This file contains a wallet canister ID which belongs to that particular identity. You should check out the content of these files with the cat command and see what is in. Since this is a beginner's lecture, we limit ourselves to the essentials. But the developer identity offers two important identifiers which we should know. The first one is the principal ID or principal identifier. You can check your currently used principal ID with a simple command again on the terminal. The command is dfx identity, identity get principal. The principal identifier itself represents a unique identifier for that particular identity. This identifier will be visible for the developer and represents the current user. It can also be seen as the public key in a special hash format and this public key belongs to the private key defined in the identity pen file. The second identifier is the so-called account ID. You get your account ID with the command dfx ledger account ID. The account ID itself is the link to the ICB ledger canister. This identifier is needed to get some ICBs for the cycle conversion for that particular identity. As you can see, there are two important identifiers which belongs to the identity pen file. It is worth to highlight that both have their own purpose and visual appearance and both use different formats. For further information on the topic, I have written a detailed article which you can consult at the link below or I recommend checking out one of the other great sessions regarding to this topic. After we saw the first building block, let's dive into the second one, the agent. And I think that is the most important part on that lecture. So what is an agent? According to the documentation, and as I have mentioned earlier, an agent is a library that is used to make calls to the Internet Computer Public Interface. But what is the purpose of this agent? The purpose can be summarized to three different points. 
The first purpose is structuring and sending data to the actor. This is done for an update and query call. An update call is a call which can change the state of a canister. And a query call is a type of call which is not changing the state of a canister. The second purpose is receiving and decoding data. Once the data has been returned from the internet computer, the agent takes the certificate from the payload and verifies it. The certificate can be verified as real using the public root key of the NNF subnet. The network or canister will respond with an encoded buffer, which the agent can then decode and transform into a useful structure using semantic language, language specific types. For example, if the type returned from the canister is text, that will get turned into a JavaScript string and so on. The third and final purpose is managing authentication. Calls to the internet computer always need to have an cryptographic identity attached. That identity will either be anonymous or authenticated using a cryptographic signature. Since identities are required, canisters can use the identity attached to the call to decide how to respond to that call. This allows contracts equal to Motopo code to use these identities for other purposes as well. For example, certain identities can call certain functions. After this theoretical part of this lecture, let's jump into a more technical one. To get started with the JavaScript agent, we need some preparation, and this preparation can be divided into two steps. As step one, we need a proper DFX JSON file with a defined backend canister. Based on this configuration, the DFX generate command will create a ready to use JavaScript agent with all needed files and declarations. The target of this process will be a new folder called Declarations under the source folder of your DFX project. As step two of this process, we have to generate the JavaScript declarations with the DFX command. For example, DFX generate asset backend. The result of this process could be seen in the mentioned folder called declarations under the source folder of your DFX project. Inside of this folder, you can see some files. The most important one is the index.js file. This file contains the JavaScript agent. The agent is available as pure vanilla JS implementation, see the index.js file, and as a TypeScript implementation, see the index.dts file. In this folder, you can see also some dit files. These files are called candid files. Candid is an interface description language developed for the internet computer. Its primary purpose is to describe the public interface of a service, equal to the Motoko canister, which has exposed public functions to use. One of the key benefits of candid is that it is language agnostic and allows other interoperation between services and frontends written in different programming languages including Motoko, Rust, and JavaScript. For a final example, we need those files that end in GS because our frontend is written in vanilla GS. You can see it marked with red color. That means that for a final example, the most important files in this folder are index.js and asset underscore backend dip.js. If you make changes to, this, to the corresponding Motoko canister, you can repeat this process as long as you have changes. I would like to mention a second way to generate these files. In your package JSON file of the DFX project is a one command predefined. You can also use npm run generate to generate these files. After this preparation work, we can start using the agent. Based on the generated files in the declaration folder, we can use this agent directly in our front-end application. And this is done with two simple steps. The first step is to use the import statement to import the agent or service into the file we need. In our case, it is the index.js file. 
The second step is to call the service by simply use the await command followed by the imported object name and the public exposed function we are going to call. A typical function call could be const all assets equals await asset underscore backhand dot get all asset. As a result, the constant all asset will have an array of all stored assets on the Motoko backend canister. And from that point on, you can use this array as you are used. All the magic is done thanks to the JavaScript agent. After we have seen the conceptual flow, let's have a short look into the agent index.js file and the asset underscore backend.js file to see how it looks like. The index.js file exports one create actor function and there is nothing special to say. In most cases, we will leave this file as it is. The only important parameter the function needs is the canister ID from the Motoko backend canister. The second file, the assets backend did.js file is much more interesting for us because you as a front-end developer can see which functions are available and can be called with which parameters and types. If you are interested in knowing more about the offered types of functions from your Motoko backend service, then you have to look exactly into that file. To get a little foretaste of the hands-on example, we can see here which properties an asset has and which methods are available for the crude application. Finally, I would like to point out that you should not only literally modify this file because this file belongs to the exposed actor functions as we have already seen and should be changed always together. We can remember at this point, first change the Motoko backend canister, then generate the agent and did files again. Finally, we have arrived at the last building block of this lecture, the actor. Most parts of the slides we have already seen or heard of it, but as an opponent of our agent, it is important to mention him again and point out that the actor represents the Motoko canister. We can use this slide as a repetition. When the front-end fetches some data from the back-end, the front-end uses the agent and the agent calls a public exposed function from the actor on the Motoko canister. The front-end can call two different types of requests. The first one is a query. A query is a very fast request and takes some milliseconds. A query must be marked as public query function in the Motoko canister. The second type of a request is an update call. An update call must be also marked as public function in the Motoko canister and it takes normally between two and four seconds to be complete. We can remember at this point Query function must be marked with a query prefix in contrast to an update function. Now that we are know something about how the front-end and the back-end canisters communicate with each other, I would like to give you a short overview which possibilities are available to build and deploy your DFX project. The build process depends on the kind of JavaScript framework you will be using. If you start with a DFX default project, you will usually use HTML, CSS, and Vanilla.js or TypeScript to develop your front-end application. But you can use also other popular JavaScript frameworks like React, Svelte, or even Angular. There are starter kits and demo implementation for all of these JavaScript frameworks out there. When it comes to the build process itself, Webpack is the default JavaScript bundler and it is ready to use but you can use also other JavaScript bundlers like Weed, Rollup, or Parcel. As a side note, if you are a beginner, you can start with the default command dfx new to get started, and you will have a ready-to-use web-free project without any pain, which is ready to deploy. Now we have finally reached the end of this first part of this lecture. Now let's jump into the hands-on example. Before we start with the hands-on example, let me give you a short overview of the example. To make things easy and understandable, I have prepared a GitHub repo and a ready-to-use CRUD application. CRUD stands in this case for Create, Read, Update and Delete functionality. I have also included a simple search function and a prepared Motoko backend canister, which we can use. 
the front end is written in vanilla JS to make it as simple as possible. The example itself displays a list of assets. The properties of each asset are name, age, and the short description. To identify the record, we use a unique key, which the user can enter by himself. From the extra side, we have some exposed public functions we can use. We have an add asset function, which can be used for the inset and update calls. The get asset function delivers an asset record for a given key, and the remove asset function can be used to remove an asset by its key. The filter assets function is used to filter by the assets name attribute, and the get all assets deliver all stored assets from the Motoko backend canister back to the frontend. Finally, a count function called get assets count is implemented as well, but it is currently not used in the demo. As a short exercise after this lecture, feel free to modify and experiment with the example in your own pace. Now I would like to leave this presentation and switch back to my desktop to show you the demo. In the demo, I use Visual Studio Code and a terminal window, but feel free to use your editor of your choice. In the demo, I will show you the simple steps to clone the repo, to start the local replica and deploy the project on your local network. After that, I show you the relevant parts of the connection between the frontend and the backend canister. Let's start in the terminal. First, let's check our Node.js version. We can do that with the command node v. And you can see I use node 16. And if you also have node 16, you are ready to go. The next step we are going to do is cloning the GitHub repo. We can do this with the simple clone command. And let's check, and we see here a new folder, ICP asset. Let's switch into this folder, ICP asset. And you can see in this folder a couple of files. So now we have cloned the GitHub repo. The next step is to install all the needed dependencies. This could be done with the npm install command. Let's check. You can see here, we have all node modules installed. I think we are ready to install and deploy our project, but first we have to start the local replica. We can do this with the dfx command, dfx start in the background. Now the local replica is starting and running. And um, now we are ready to deploy our project. And this could be done with dfx deploy. As you can see here on the debug messages, the front end and the back end canister are created. And uh, here you can see a very interesting line of message. You can see here. The declarations for the canister asset back asset backend are generated here. And in this process also the index.js file is generated. And in this index.js file in this folder is our ancient placed. And uh, now you can see everything is successfully installed. And here we have some URLs and uh, we need this URL asset frontend, we copy this asset frontend URL and switch back to the to, to browser window. And here we go. Now we have access to the already deployed frontend application and we see here a filter and we see here an add button, but we have here a list without any records. So now let's add a new record. We can click the Add button. And now we have to insert some data. So we say this is key one. 
the name is uh, Maria, the age is 20, and as a description we say, this is Maria. And let's click save. So I think um, this took some time because of the local replica, but now it's saved. And you can see here, we have the first record stored on the Motoko backend canister. Let's add another one. This is K2. This is Roland, and Roland is a little bit older, 25. This is Roland. And click the Save button. After some seconds, also the second record is successfully saved. So what we have seen here is that we have uh, inserted two assets here and uh, we can change it as well. So when we click on Maria, so we load the detailed data from Maria and then we can send Maria uh, Susanna and uh, this is Maria and his sister. And now when we hit the save button, then the record will be updated. And you see Maria and Susanna. So you can use the find function. So when we look for Roland, and you see it's working. And um, we have also a delete button. So when we are going to delete one record, now the record is deleted. So I think you have now a basic understanding or basic understanding of this example. And now let's jump into the source code to see how it looks like. And for that, we can go to the terminal back and type code dot and push studio code. Open a new window here and let's see what is inside this project folder. You see, this is a way to use DFX new project. And uh, we have here a source folder, and in the source folder, we have our declarations. And in this declarations, we have this index.js file, which I have mentioned. And uh, when you look inside this index.js file, this file looks like, as you have seen it, into the slides, and uh, it's ready to use. The only important part here is uh, that you know something more about your backend canister ID. And this is here the import uh, from this backend canister ID. And uh, the next important file here is the asset backend DGS file. And this is the declaration file for our asset backend canister. And what we can see here is that we have here two type definitions. The first type is a key, and the key is a text here. And uh, the second type is an asset, and this is a record. Uh, but this record will be transformed into an object when uh, the agent does his work. And then we have here a service object with all the functions we can use and the parameter, parameters we are going uh, to use. And yeah, so, but the important part here is these files will be generated automatically when you deploy your project or when you run the command from the package JSON file, here uh, npm generate or dfx generate asset backend. And this command is based on the dfx JSON file, as we have seen. And here we have the definition of the canister. And this is the bridge between the front end and the back end. So now let's look into the source folder here. We have here the asset front end. And um, when you look into the source folder, here is our project um, placed. And uh, the project starts with a simple HTML file. This is a really simple boilerplate from a single page application point of view. And uh, we have here an index.js file. Uh, this is the file where our web pack comes into the game and uh, we have a simple app function and this app function call 
an init function and this init function will be imported through this asset functions file here on this. And uh, when we look into this file, then we have in the first line the import of the declarations. And with this declarations import, also the agent will come into this into this file. And we have here an object, it's called as a backend, and that's it. So the next step to use one of the public exposed functions from the Nodoko backend canister is everything the same. So we have here the object and then we use the method. Some methods will have some values, parameters, which the function needs, and others will don't have parameters, like this await asset underscore backend get all assets. And then here, at this point, const assets, you will have an array with all the assets, an object array in JavaScript with all the assets you have stored on your Motoko backend canister. And that's it. So what I would like to show you with this example is this is a vanilla GS crude application. This application has nearly 400 lines of code and we need only some lines of code to connect the front end and the back end canister. And I think this is an awesome thing because the agent does really the heavy lifting for us and we don't have to care about anything. So we have a simple function call here and that's it. Now, I think I'm on the end of my presentation here. And, um, but as I have mentioned, you could play a little bit with this project. And uh, to play with this project, you can use the, let me show you, you can use the uh, Webpack demo, the Webpack development server here. And this is also a way to use. So when you try to change something on the front end, you can start this development server and you can do this with the npm start command or you can also use npm run start and then the webpack development development server is started and um, you will have a new, new url here so you have to call the webpack development server on localhost on 8081 so let's jump back to this. And you see, we have here the same as on the local replica. And uh, when you had something change in your Motoko on your project, then, so we go to the index file and we say um, vanilla chairs implementation for Motoko Bootcamp 2023 and you reload it and you see here you have here live reloading and uh, you can play a little bit with the front end. So what does this mean? The front end is running on the Webpack development server but the front end uses the deployed backend canister which is running on your local replica and I think this is the important part to know so only the front end is running in a development mode so when you want to bring this change to production or to the local network then you have to you then you have to deploy the front end again so you can do this when you stop this webpack server and we can say deploy dfx deploy asset front end okay Uh, 
Okay, small typo. Here we go. And you see, in this case, we are only deploy the front end canister again. And when you reload this, you see, now your changes are also deployed to your local replica. And um, so the last thing I would like to show you is, we have seen here the package JSON file. I think you can look at this and you see, we have seen that we have the npm start command here. This is important. So we can also generate the asset backend declaration new with the dfx generate as a backend, backend command or with the npm run generate for example so you have several commands here and um, the last thing what i would like to show you here in this live coding session is under the dot dfx command so you have here a canister id json file and sometimes this file is important for you because here you can see which canister ids you are going to use in this project so you see here the canister id for your backend canister for your frontend canister and even for your candid ui interface where you can test your backend canister but when you play a little bit with this project, you can also um, use the command line to test the functions on the Motoko backend canister. For example, you can use the dfx canister command. For example, dfx canister call asset backend get asset. K1, and you can see we don't have a K1, K2. Okay, all right. So, and uh, in this way, you can also test all Motoko backend canister functions from the terminal here, and uh, then you can implement it also uh, in the front end. So I think I'm on the end of my presentation. Now let's jump back to the presentation to finish this presentation. The only thing I would like to say now is thank you for your attention. It's time for some Q and A and I hope you have learned something new and I will try to give my pass to answer all of your questions. Thank you and goodbye. All right, so as I've said before, uh, Roland is uh, unfortunately not here this morning, but uh, I'll try to answer some questions. Uh, I haven't prepared this lecture, so I might not be able to answer everything, um, but feel free to, to ask. I've seen we have already some questions. Uh, the source code, I will ask uh, Roland if he can uh, push it. Uh, I think there is a repo, okay. Yeah. Um, Slava, can you can you precise your question? I'm not sure to get it. Uh, maybe you should indicate which part of the video it was related to. I can give you access to the to the mic. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question was related. Um, I saw during the video when we add in uh, some uh, some entities uh, we are storing in stable memory uh, there is stable construction it means that uh, when we uh, install or upgrade our canister version uh, then the stable construction what it does uh, it restore previous our state and use it but my question is related. Um, uh, if I got right, uh, this stable construction, it works for uh, one particular node. But uh, usually in Web2 projects, we have a really big database and we use 
uh, sharding concept. So it means that we can um, drop in smaller databases and we can uh, use it as a single one um, entity. Uh, but uh, I didn't see the same mechanism or inside this um, mechanism because uh, I expected that at some point when our application is going uh, to be bigger, we need to uh, drop uh, our database entity into smaller ones. And my question is related uh, how uh, we can do the same mechanism or maybe I got some wrong, maybe there is some other mechanism, uh, how we handle growing size of database uses, uh, using these canisters because I didn't see any usage of database. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, can you just, uh, does someone ask the time exactly where it shows the Motoko part? Because I, I can't find it, I only see. It. Uh, it's inside backend, as a backend folder. Yeah, but I cannot really access the code. So like, I need to. Ah, uh, I, I dropped actually, the link to inside actually, the chat. Actually, I ah. can. Just, just give me a second, please. I will drop in the chat. Yeah, OK, I got it. Uh, so uh, source backend main.demo. Yeah, and uh, line, what is it? Uh, 14, yeah. line 14, yes, table. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I guess here is using stable because. Uh, yeah, it's demo project. It's not. Yeah, it's pretty. Demo. It's pretty simple, and I mean, uh, I think there is some echo. Yeah, it's pretty simple. So it's just using this. Uh, a stable variable will not be erased during upgrade, as you as you know. Um, so your question was pretty broad. Like, how do you scale? I think this is uh, one of the biggest question in the community and there are different answers. So um, first one, the stable memory is constantly growing. Uh, so I'm going to give the answer to like uh, day one, I think. Uh, there is four gigabyte of heap uh, in canisters right now because uh, it's using a runtime of WebAssembly that is uh, 32 bits. So it's limited to four gigabytes, but the stable memory is using a 64 bit uh, API and you have I think right now it's yeah it's 48 gigabyte uh <clears throat> so that means with the stable memory plus the ip you have six, uh, 52 gigabytes inside a canister and this limitation of 48 for stable memory is constantly growing um the real limitation would be the limitation of the subnet uh, a subnet right now can store 500 gigabytes uh, 450 gigabytes so if an application on the IC would uh, require more memory, they could increase it to uh, the limit of the subnet. And then I guess the only solution would be to grow uh, either inter subnet. So you could have canisters in different subnets that source uh, your data, or you could uh, also grow the subnets. I think the second generation of nodes will be um, one level more performant than the node of generation one. So you get more memory. Um, probably subnet will be one terabyte or even more. So that's the first answer. Then you can scale. You can also check uh, CanDB. It's uh, I'm not 100% familiar with the code. Like I, I, I have, I haven't had the time to check the code, but it's um, a SQL database that is supposed to scale automatically for you on the IC using multiple canisters. Um, so I think that that would be something you were looking for. And also, I think they are using uh, some stable data structure. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, there are a lot of answers to this question. I think OpenChat uh, is the is the application that run into issues due to uh, subnet limitation. And they are growing um, inter subnet. So they, so they have uh, deployed uh, many, many in many, many different subnets, I think, now. Also, they use one canister per user, so they have like a lot of uh, available space for each user. I think every time you start a conversation, you have a new canister that is spawned. Um, yeah, 
that's a lot, but basically right now it's a mix between a few different solutions and it's also depend on the application. So for example, um, sorry, maybe you're not familiar with OpenChat, but it's a messaging application on the IC and it's really easy to um, kind of compartiment into different canisters. So like each user will have its canister, each, each chat group will create a new canister. Um, some applications are, of course, more difficult to abstract with many, many canisters. So I guess that depends on the on the architecture. But right now, um, the yeah, the answer is for scaling scalability. It's a mix between scaling the canisters, like the, the numbers of canisters, and also scaling the canister itself. Um, I think at some point the dream is. Uh, WebAssembly 64 bits, and we'll get uh, like a lot of memory inside the canister. So yeah, if you have uh, more questions, feel free to ask it. Uh, uh, I, hope, yeah. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, one, one question, usually uh, when we talk about Web2 uh, vertical scaling, it's uh, much more expensive than just uh, add uh some more machines so uh, I, i'm not sure if uh i see has the same principle so if we have machine with four gigabytes of memory then uh having uh let's say 48 gigabyte machine uh, it uh it costs like a thousand of machines oh uh, uh, the good thing is that if you create a canister it will only take up the memory it needs uh, in terms of the nodes. So like a canister can store up to uh, 52 gigabytes, but then if you just use it for like uh, one or two megabytes, it's not going to like require um, that much amount of memory as long as it's not taken uh, at some point, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got it. Uh, thanks, uh, you answered fully. How to resolve the network warning after the FX new? The warning is using the default definition for the local. Oh, yes. Uh, so I also discovered this warning. So the FX is uh, constantly <laughs> reworking, uh, rework, been reworked, sorry. And I think they want to disable, disable the local, uh, like you don't have to. I Let me check the exact warning. I had the same, I was working on a project. Um, ah, it's not on this machine. Yeah, I think that you can remove the local, um, in the defic.json, you should have a local file. So we can check it out here, maybe. Oh yeah, there, there is no, uh, you can input a network and then local, but I think they want to remove this option. So if you just remove that, you should get away with the warning, but uh, <laughs> the warning is not, that uh, problematic, it, it will not uh, cause any issue, just a message. While integrating with the internet identity, are there any pitfalls one should be aware of? Yes, uh, so internet identity is great. Um, to add a bit more context, uh, I think Definity wanted to provide a solution, identity solution out of the box. So they, they created that. Um, of course, it's like, it was extremely important for them to have something when the network launched uh, or around the same time because uh, we needed that to, I mean, start the network, like uh, start uh, staking and uh, having functionalities, having some applications. Um, there was no wallet at that time. There was no other identity provider. Uh, but they made a choice, which is to basically make things more complicated for developers. So. Each time you have an uh, internet identity and you connect uh, with a canister, um, your identity will depend on the canister. Um, so your principle will change. Let's say I have a principle on Discover and I have a principle on OpenChat. It's not going to be the same. So if OpenChat wants to know something about me on Discover, they can't uh, by default. So they, uh, they've chosen to go privacy by default. 
um, which I think was the best choice because, uh, of course, it makes things, things more complicated and it took more time for many developers to get around that. But now we have solutions. Um, you can uh, you, ca you can kind of um, ask users for information or you have some patterns for uh, apps to communicate. Um, but this is not by default. But if you use something like wallet, uh, like plug wallet, for example, you will have the, the same principle on all applications. Uh, so it makes your life way easier as a developer. You can just uh, get like you you know your user is going to like if you if you if you get the principle, then you can check uh, the balance of each token. You can get information on like the user profile on another app. Uh, so of course that's way more possibilities and way easier, but, um, internet identity was, uh, yeah, was private by default because that, that makes more sense to, you can move from the privacy to like adding features, uh, to connect dApps. but if you don't do the privacy by default, it's impossible to go back. Uh, so, so I think that's why they choose that pattern. Um, yeah. And also one of the pitfalls I would say is uh, internet identity locally is a mess to deploy. I don't know if they have fixed that since uh, a long time, but I know it was the case for me. Uh, so that's uh, one of other pitfalls. Uh, but I think most wallets are also a pain in just to work with locally anyway. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Where to get the link to these bootcamp videos? Uh, so yeah, I'm a bit late on the recordings. Uh, I'm uploading right now the one from yesterday, the, um, the one that was on uh, options and null values. I will get uh, the one that was uh, this night. So um, what was the lecture about? Let me check. So yeah, the, the one that was tonight, uh, which was... Generic types and array. We don't have the video yet. Uh, we'll get it in a few hours, but I'm going to upload it on YouTube. And the recording link is available on Discord. You have the, the link to the playlist on YouTube. Do we have more questions? Let's check the, I think we can. Go here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So is NFID frequently used instead of internet identity? I think so. Um, I've seen a few apps using it uh, and of course more and more apps using it. Um, NFID is basically built upon internet identity. So um, they they are focusing entirely on identity. I think uh, it's identity labs. They are doing a great job. I think they have more features coming uh, like they have, um, you can add a phone number to the user. So that's super useful because uh, for a lot of applications, we have problems with bots. So that's not like 100% bot proof, bot proof, but having this verification kind of limit the number of bots. Um, they also going to release very verifiable credentials. So that's uh, going to be very useful for like inter, DAP uh, communication. So you can ask one DAP uh, to verify something like, let's say the user is um, older than 18 years old, but you don't have to know uh, the age of the user as well. So I think that they have something like this coming up in F NFID. I'm not 100% up to date with that, um, but NFID is a great solution. So NFID internet computer i think we'll find good things here yep
yeah, so you can check this documentation. I think they, oh, they, they've added a lot of things since uh, last time I checked. So I'm gonna send the link. Pros and cons of NFID uh, compared to internet identity. Uh, I would say, I would say uh, probably NFID is better to use, like more easy than internet identity. But I would say also, I think internet identity um, is like easily more verifiable. I'm pretty sure if you use NFID, you still have to trust a bit uh, the developers behind it, uh, which are great persons. So I know they, they are not uh, building this uh, to screw you, but I think internet identity is way easier to verify right now. Uh, that's probably going to change in the future, uh, of course, but NFID, I'm, I don't exactly know, uh, but I might be wrong, so don't uh, quote me on that. Um, otherwise, the pros and cons, yeah, I think I've already answered, like internet identity is a bit complicated to work with. Uh, so that's what is what is said here is different identities are issued for each app a user authenticate to and cannot be linked back to the user. Also, um, I think, yeah, also it depends on the hosts that you're using. So like if you access the same app from different front end, you will get uh, different uh, principle. So that's like really, really high privacy, but I think now you can add, um, like you can access the same app from different hosts. Uh, yeah, I think internet identity is a really cool uh, app to check it out if you have time. Uh, of course, it was made by Definity, and there is a lot of um, things they had to take care of. Like, for example, they're using only stable memory. Um, that would have been really, really complicated if they wanted to upgrade and they were not using stable memory. Uh, they were not like they didn't want to risk any issue about losing data. So they only use stable memory. Um, and they have, uh, I think they have a few articles to explain how they've built internet identity, the, the challenges they face, uh, how to prevent uh, like spamming of internet identity and uh, a few other things they had to think about deeply. Um, so yeah, it's a great dub, uh, but it's, it's rust. There will be um, something on internet identity on day four uh, and generally identity on the IC. Uh, I think both there, there is a lecture from uh, there is a lecture from the guys of NFID. They will come. Uh, they will do a talk on identity and um, authentication on the authentication on the IC. Um, I think they'll talk about NFID, but they will talk more broadly about uh, this topic. Uh, and also in the guides, I'm working on something for uh, day four. So stay tuned. Um, I should also add that I'm going to release an update on the core project and I strongly recommend to use plug wallets uh, as of today. This is not a recommendation on like what you should use for after the camp. Um, but for, the, for this like project that you have to do, um, it will re really make your life easier. Uh, and also we had a few issues with uh, the latest standard, I I ICRC1, and uh, Plug Wallet seems to be supporting it right now uh, and not all other wallets. So just, just adding that. I think I've answered all the questions, yeah. So if we don't have more questions, gonna end this session and uh, I'm going to release the day three because I think I'm late, it's nine, yeah. <laughs> so thanks everyone for joining uh, and uh, have a good day, see you later.